steps. And it's appropriate time to sort of tee this up in, in, in keeping with the general themes of today's meeting to get your advice um, as to how this can be, be taken further. Um, Self-reported physical activity was collected at baseline as part of the touchscreen questionnaire, but I think it's recognised that that can be uh, somewhat subjective. So as part of the uh, enhancements to the core uh, assessment, we were funded to measure, to take, get an objective measure of seven-day physical activity. And this, is, uh, and this was recommended very strongly by uh, Professor Nick Wareham and his group. Um, and they built the argument that previous methods to quantify not only the pattern but the total volume of energy expenditure uh, are imprecise. Um, and there was a real need to be able to demonstrate uh, the real effect of the association of activity with major chronic disease. And there was an opportunity, which has come up actually many times uh, in, in UK Biobank, to use these new technologies to accurately estimate physical activity and, and energy expenditure. Um, and of course, using non-invasive methods. If we're going to do this on a large scale and remotely, uh, in other words, sending devices out to people, it needs to be non-invasive. And then this will allow us at a, at, a, at a high level to clarify the dose response between activity and outcomes, but hopefully, as, as, as you will see, as this, as, as this piece of work evolves, not only to do that, but to look at the various dimensions of the type of physical activity, the intensity, because of course in self-reported, one person's idea of intense physical activity may be different from another person's. Um, the frequency and duration, of course, I, I draw a parallel here with, with diet questionnaires that people will tend to record their main meals, but they miss all the bits in the middle, the snacks and so forth. And here you miss all the sort of small bits of physical activity um, and the total volume, of course. Um, we worked very closely with Nick's group and with Soren Braga uh, looking at uh, how we would do this. It was clear there were some limitations of the exi uh, existing devices. Uh, those that were available didn't directly measure uh, activity in fundamental units of acceleration. Um, and th th there's a gap in the data in that they don't store the raw data on the device. They will use their own proprietary algorithms to store derived data on the device. And the sampling frequency is low, which gives a, a somewhat uh, fragmented picture. And of course, again, with anything, if you're going to do it at large scale, we were proposing to do this in 100,000 people, the cost is a significant factor. Um, so we initiated a really uh, a, a large piece of work with, uh, with Nick's group at the University of Cambridge to think about exactly how we would do this, not just in terms of the development of the device, but the way it should be administered and used. Uh, and subsequently on their recommendation, we uh, also engaged with a group at the University of Newcastle and a spin out there under Patrick Olivier with the activity group to develop the first device. And the, the challenges for this really that should be cheap uh, and reusable, and it's based on these uh, micro electromechanical uh, devices. It's the same chip which is in the airbag uh, system of your car, and if it measures a deceleration greater than a certain amount, it thinks you've had an accident and it will fire the airbag, but it's the same, it's the same principle. Um, it has a high frequency of data acquisition, in our case 100 hertz, with sufficient battery life to allow for seven days of recording of activity and the, the dispatch of those devices to the, to the individuals. And in our case, we wanted it to record and store the raw data in fundamental units of G of gravity. Um, and, and this process on this scale must be easy to administer. So the first devices, you can see at top right there, it looks a bit like an old fashioned digital watch. Um, this was sent out to people to be worn on the wrist of the dominant hand there you see at the bottom. Um, and before we did this, we, before we started to send this out, we did quite a bit of substantial amount of testing. These, I, I mentioned about the raw data captured on the device. These are the type of data that you get. Um, and you can see at the top there, that's, that's just under a day's worth of data. And you get data, you see three different colored, colored lines, and that, that is uh, acceleration in three planes, X, Y, and Z. And you can see each, each plane is colored a different color. And what this allows you to do, of course, is to expand this out, go down to a very fine level of detail, and you can see the individual activity there. That's a fairly quiet period of activity. We also did some testing with some, uh, some activities. Now, these, these are not controlled reference sequences. We shouldn't say this, but we wanted to see uh, what these kinds of activities look like. So this is general wear around the office on the top over a couple of hours. Um, one of our members of staff wore this when she went swimming, a very sort of regular frequent activity, and you can see about three quarters of the way along, she turned around and, and started to go back the other way. 
and then a, a game of squash there, you can see these quite violent um, spikes where presumably the person is hitting the ball. Um, we also tested it on a, a, a very reproducible activity. The top trace uh, shows somebody wearing this on one of these static rowing machines. Um, and what this actually shows you is you can actually separate out the three axes and just look at the, um, the, 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 the axes of, of, of activity individually. And you can see this highly uh, periodic reciprocating um, activity. There's quite a bit of interest uh, in the sleep community in using this device because you can tell uh, between, you can di distinguish between the activity when people are actually wearing this in the top trace at the far left hand end as you look at it, you can see five, six, seven, that person is actually wearing that device while they're in bed. And we set up some control experiments here on the bottom over an hour where it was deliberately taken off and just put on the table. And you can see the only uh, activity you're recording is 1G downwards, you're measuring gravity. And the background noise of the, red, of the red and the green line is very, very small indeed. So it will enable researchers in the sleep community to distinguish whether people are wearing them and then link different uh, sleep patterns to, to health outcomes. Uh, I mentioned that this device is worn on the dominant hand. So as part of this testing, we wanted to look at uh, device reproducibility and also the impact of orientation between left and right hand and the orientation of the device. You can appreciate you can wear the thing in, in one of two orientations on either hand, depending on which way you do the strap up. So uh, again, we did this on a row machine because it was a very controlled activity. <clears throat> uh, and we wore two devices, one on top of each other and then swapped them around. So you can see the traces on the right, although the, the axes have been reassigned because obviously we've turned around the devices just, just by looking at them by eye um, and nothing more sophisticated than that. You can see that they overlap very well. Uh, and then Simon Sheard at uh, UK Biobank um, we're not trying to overstate this. This is not a principal component analysis, but Simon carried out a fast Fourier transform on this to identify the principal frequencies. And you can see the two devices there on the X, Y, and Z plane. And the first thing to say is they look very similar. And reassuringly, given that this is 30 strokes per minute, the principal frequency is half a hertz. So we were, we were reasonably reassured that these devices were, were, were robust and, and were recording data. So we decided to start sending these out to participants. And this slide just summarizes the process. A, an email invitation is sent to the participant asking them if they'd be prepared to wear a device. And they can confirm by telephone or by email to our coordinating center at the University of Cardiff that John uh, uh, Gallagher runs. The device is configured with a, a uni unique identifier and a start and a stop time, which is typically two to three days after it's been sent out to allow it to get through the post. And then that's put into a mailing pack, which is shown at the bottom which is a letter from Rory, some frequently asked questions, and you see there are a padded mail bag that once the uh, participants have finished wearing this device, they can put it in there and it's sent back to the, uh, the participant resource center. This is, uh, it's really importantly that this is prompted by an automated email or a, uh, a text once their seven days is up. Those devices come back, the data are downloaded in a serial fashion, the devices are cleaned, they can be uh, just wiped over and the straps just washed and then they're reconfigured for, for the next use. Um, and this is where we've got to. Uh, we've sent out 72,000 invitations to our participants and we've had a positive acceptance rate of 45%. 45% of those people have either worn a device or said they will wear a device. And we're sending out about 1,200 devices a week at the moment. We've just ordered another batch and activity, and when they arrive in a few weeks, we'll be up around the 1,600 devices per week. We've obtained just under 30,000 data sets, and rather importantly, we are hitting a 14-day cycle time. And what that means is from sending the device out to a participant, then wearing it, sending it back, getting the data off, cleaning it, and it being ready to be sent out again is 14 days. And that's rather important that we have the availability of these devices that we can maintain uh, the rate of recruitment. And also encouragingly shown at the bottom there, 95% of our participants are wearing this device for more than five days, uh, and 82% of them are wearing it for seven days. So next steps, what we've, what we've done is we've shown that this, this will work, that it's, it's feasible and affordable to send this device out, and participants are prepared to wear them. And we will continue this data collection until we've acquired 100,000 participants' data sets. And at our current rate, this will be about June 2015. Um, 
in keeping with the way that, that has worked very well in UK Biobank, we're now in the process of establishing a, a working group, which, which Nick has very kindly agreed to, to chair, um, and to identify the short and the medium term priorities as to what the best way to handle these data and, and, and what analyses should be done. So what derived data, for example, can be extracted from the raw data, and is the requirement for data cleaning? Are there certain activities with, with characteristic traces which may give misleading um, uh, uh, values for, for, for activity, such as working at a computer, which can be removed by data cleaning, or is that not necessary? Um, we will establish a completely anonymized test data set so that researchers can develop algorithms on these data. Of course, they won't be linked to any other participant data. And this group will also consider the need for validation studies against gold standard uh, measures of energy utilization, such as doubly labeled water. It would be nice, I think, to get some exemplar projects going, and it's possible uh, there's, a, there's a great deal of enthusiasm in the, the sleep community to do this. Um, and then longer term, developing algorithms that, in what appears to be this rather noisy uh, data, that you can identify discrete activities by, by referencing against reference sets, and then possibly other activities as well. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll take them now. Otherwise, I think Rory's gone off with my program. So uh, it's John, John Gallagher next who's going to talk about web-based um, assessment of cognitive function. Thanks, Roy. Cheers. Everyone's done it, don't you? Um, my name is John Gallagher. I'm a psychologist by training who's become an epi epidemiologist by a process of osmosis. Um, and I hope that uh, that's been a, a good training for what I'm about to tell you, to discuss with you. A cognitive assessment and web questionnaires. Um, from the cognitive point of view, I would like to acknowledge th this team, but also from the uh, dietary uh, assessment perspective, there's a, a team in uh, CTSU and the Cancer Epidemiology Unit uh, who have put an enormous amount of work into developing a diet questionnaire suitable for web administration. So, let's just uh, for a brief moment look at our web questionnaire strategy. Of course, the advantage of web questionnaires, they're very flexible, they're, they're very cost effective. And there is a disadvantage in the sense that you need to be connected in order to uh, answer them. Uh, but nevertheless, I, I think they offer an enormous opportunity for epidemiology, particularly etiological epidemiology, where you're looking for associations from diverse ranges of outcomes, uh, outcomes with diverse ranges even, and uh, sorry, exposures with diverse ranges and various outcomes. Okay, so our, our strategy is to fill some exposure gaps in terms of uh, occupational residential history uh, through the, the web questionnaire and also to uh, monitor lifestyle changes uh, such as diet and uh, that diet was our very first foray uh, into I should say forage shouldn't I uh, into this area uh, we're also looking at outcomes uh, particularly outcomes that are poorly recorded or ru non routinely recorded um, we can ask them we can either get the information from participants or particularly in the case of dementia from informants so we're really trying to, to exploit the use of this technology to see whether we can collect as much information as possible to a high standard but nevertheless extremely cost effectively and particular areas of interest apart from lifestyle are uh, mental health uh, you, you know, it, the recording of mental health problems is, is severely underreported. Uh, uh, it's cyclical, and these things aren't picked up by uh, primary care records or secondary care records very well. But through a web questionnaire, you can do it in a much uh, more detailed fashion. And of course, a cognitive decline, uh, very, very important. And it's very difficult to get people to come to a clinic on repeated occasions. It's far easier to get them to come to a computer on repeated occasions, although it has its own challenges as well. Don't think we're not aware of that. Just to use the diet questionnaire for a moment, so the diet questionnaire is a good example as a test of how acceptable this method is. And the diet questionnaire uh, was, conducted, was, was piloted in the, the assessment clinics and then uh, uh, 
the people with email addresses were emailed over uh, a period of several months on repeated occasions. And uh, out of 350,000 roughly people with email addresses, we have uh, over 200,000 people who have completed the questionnaire. And many of them have completed it on multiple occasions. Uh, and this is without great outcries coming to the participant resource center, how dare you send me uh, an email. Uh, actually been very well received, it's very acceptable, and we look forward very much to the uh, data being analyzed. So this method actually does work. Uh, it, it is acceptable to people. And as far as we can tell, and I think the early signs are good, uh, it does produce high quality data. If we go on to cognitive assessment, um, essentially we, we have a, a strategy which leads uh, from clinic assessment into web-based assessment. There's a baseline core battery, a uh, comprising reaction time, paired associates learning, uh, reasoning, digit recall, and um, prompted action. Uh, and essentially, these, things, these tests were selected to be slightly memory focused and to tap into uh, areas that we know uh, the evidence is strong uh, that are related to dementia. And uh, we are just preparing now for a, a web-based reassessment of cognitive function. Uh, and if you like, an enhanced battery, which is the core battery, uh, plus a trail-making test and a digit symbol substitution test. And the frequency of remeasurement is not, is not firmed up. It would be according to age. And we would welcome uh, your input and your suggestions as to various remeasurement strategies that we might use. Then we come on to an imaging uh, baseline assessment, uh, which is the, there is a piloting image going on, and if that is successful, there is an anticipation that there will be a, a very high-scale imaging uh, process, including three Tesla brain imaging occurring beginning in early 2015. And uh, we would like to re-administer the cognitive test then and add perhaps one or two more. We'd like to work closely with the NIH in terms of their toolbox tests, again, to, to, to in increase the, the detail of the cognitive phenotype available to the study. And that recently, the MRC have funded the UK Dementias platform. And the UK Dementias platform, part of its, uh, uh, one of the a major plank in, in its bid was to uh, reassess cognitively and image and a biomarker reassess uh, 10,000 people at a two-year interval. This will produce uh, the world's biggest resource for experimental medicine by an order of magnitude. And uh, we're very excited about this. And Biobank have been extremely uh, helpful, extremely encouraging in seeing how we can work together to develop this national resource uh, and make it available uh, for experimental medicine. I mean, it's just a very interesting point, isn't it? The, the importance of repurposing uh, very highly characterized cohorts for experimental purposes, uh, because by, only by those sorts of means we'll be able to make a more rapid progress in dementia. So we will have an enriched battery, and again, these things, all of these tests will be uh, uh, web uh, compliant, uh, should I say. All right, so let's just look at the tests in case you're particularly interested. Uh, there are various tests there, reaction time, paired associates learning, et cetera, et cetera. And they're assessing distinct cognitive domains, uh, like simple processing speed, uh, episodic memory, uh, fluid intelligence, working memory, perspective memory, visual attention, executive function, complex processing speed, and crystallized intelligence. This doesn't exhaust the cognitive domains, but it's an, for an epidemiologic study, it is an exceptionally rich range of uh, domains being measured on an exceptionally large number of people. So for the first two, who, these tests were part of the original baseline examination. We have uh, data on 450,000 uh, people. Uh, for the next uh, three, ne the next three were added uh, partway through the clinic, and we have data on 115,000. And for the remaining th uh, three tests, uh, the, the trail making and digit, digit symbol substitution tests, uh, they will be part of the web platform. We anticipate, I think this is a very conservative estimate, 100,000 tests being completed. Um, uh, and when we go through the clinic, it all being well, there will be 100,000 people going through the baseline imaging who will be, Im who'll be uh, administered the battery again. So this is a very, very rich uh, cognitive phenotype which we are developing. Okay, this is a, a just, a, just to give you a picture of the, the reaction time test. Very, if, when you get the two symbols come the same, you hit the button and your reaction time is, is tested, which even I can do this one. I found this one a bit more challenging though. This is where you play a game of pairs and you, you get shown the, the cards and you cover it over and then you have to guess where the pairs are. Uh, I really did feel my age uh, when doing this one. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's, a, it's a very good test of, of susceptibility or risk for dementia. 
And here is a child making test where you have to think ahead, where you have to link the, uh, the numbers in, in sequential order. Trust me, this is the easy version. There is a harder one, but I wouldn't want to spoil it for you. Does the data make any sense? Well, here we have reaction time. You have this classic log normal distribution. Um, uh, and if you look at the, uh, the mean reaction time by age, you have the classic uh, incremental uh, slowing of reaction time by age group. So this is very, very nice data. If we go on to episodic memory, uh, this isn't a log normal distribution. This is a slightly truncated distribution. Um, in one sense, for some people, not me, for some people this test was just a little bit too easy. And so for the, for the, the web version, we're going to make a, a harder condition so that we can have a no, more normal distribution. But nevertheless, you'll see that there is a very nice incremental uh, increase in the number of, re, of uh, uh, incorrect responses made with age. So again, that, that's very encouraging. And finally, fluid intelligence. This is, this is a fascinating one, actually. Um, uh, this is measured by uh, 12 questions, half of which are numeric, half of which are verbal. And we find that we have a, a normal distribution, more or less, which, we, which we're very happy with. But when you look at the distribution of uh, mean values by age, it only begins to decline up at the upper age groups. And that's very encouraging. The question is, why doesn't it decline all the way through? And uh, we suspect that's because, although this is primarily a test of fluid intelligence, there's a little bit of crystallized intelligence going on there. And it's probably due to the verbal reasoning items as opposed to the numeric reasoning items. And I look forward very much, uh, when I get a bit of time, to teasing these two things out. So what I, in conclusion, we have a, a very, very useful and flexible medium and we have an increasingly rich data set. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I'm going to suggest that we, uh, we, we use perhaps five minutes at the end to, to take some questions, and I'll invite our, our final speaker in this, uh, this session, Professor Barbara Castellet from the University of Oxford, who are going to, has, who's going to talk about plans for monitoring of arrhythmia. Thank you very much. Ah, okay. Thank you very much. So this is going to be mostly an aspirational talk. Um, it is really uh, an answer to the question, what else can we do within Biobank to enrich the phenotyping of the participants? And uh, you might have noticed here this picture that was shown at the beginning that shows the path uh, that the biobank participants uh, went through during the first baseline assessment uh, visit. And uh, you may have noticed uh, that there is no electrocardiogram included. And this is because it was thought that this was not practical, it would take too long and possibly tip the threshold uh, through how much the participants could put up with and uh, maybe curtail the recruitment rate. And so it was not uh, included. However, you've also heard that patients have been recalled to further assessments later on called, uh, um, and, and one of them uh, was this one. And uh, that is the cardio testing, an exercise uh, testing on a stationary bicycle where uh, the uh, four lead ECGs was recorded. Um, the participants had 15 minutes uh, of ECG record, 15 seconds, sorry, of ECG recording at rest, followed by six minutes of exercise on a bicycle and one minute of recording and as uh, always is in uh, Biobank, uh, it was done in a large number of participants, 85,000. Uh, so uh, what we have here, as I said, is the ECG recording, uh, uh, but also we have variable levels of exercise tailored to the risk of the patients, a, a risk that was assessed on the basis of the past medical history and cardiovascular events or other uh, factors such as uh, possible pregnancy and so on. Um, so we have variable levels of exercise, uh, uh, but uh, ECG in all of these patients. Uh, we have started to look at these ECGs, and as you can expect from the lead position and the fact that there are only four leads, uh, the quality is variable. So I've shown you the worst, which is possibly impossible or near impossible to analyze, to some of the best, and the majority would be in between. 
So what can we um, analyze? What, what data can we get from these ECGs? I mean, the most reliable data here would be the uh, presence of tachyarrhythmias, either a baseline or induced by exercise, notably atrial fibrillation. Uh, we have uh, a pretty good accuracy in the detection of the RR interval and therefore of the heart rate. Uh, not so good for other quantitative traits uh, that people might be interested in, such as uh, QT interval, PR interval, and, and so on. So uh, what also this um, test would offer is the analysis of the pattern of the heart rate response during exercise. And uh, the pattern of the heart rate response during exercise can also then be linked to all of the other assessments that have been done uh, and, and the characteristic of, of these patients. Um, I have to say that over the years, uh, studies linking the pattern of heart rate increase and post-exercise recovery have uh, generated a number of uh, um, high-profile publications in a number of journals, in a number of conditions, with much smaller and more, more poorly characterized cohort than UK Biobank. So there is a scope really of looking at this data further. So what is it going to come? The digitized 12 lead ECG is now part of the imaging uh, assessment of the next recall of the uh, UK Biobank participants. And here we have uh, uh, much more uh, of a opportunity to look at all of the uh, fine uh, characteristic of the uh, ECG, including, uh, as I said, all the PR interval, the repolarization patterns, the QT interval, as well as uh, uh, possible uh, arrhythmias. And we have a way of, uh, we will have a way of linking uh, the ECGs with all of, of the characteristics and uh, also biomarkers that are uh, um, uh, collected in the context of biobank, but also using, uh, looking at how the ECG characteristic and particularly abnormality of heart rhythm would uh, feed into other uh, measurements such as, for instance, the cognitive decline. Uh, similar, uh, the same kind of feedback can be done with the imaging. I mean, this is an incredibly powerful combination of looking really at uh, the, uh, uh, for instance, um, the impact of some uh, abnormalities uh, that can be uh, derived from uh, cardiac MRI on ECG patterns and equally uh, the impact of the ECG patterns and rhythm on uh, not only a cognitive decline but also cerebrovascular disease. So this is uh, really uh, very interesting to the, I think, to the uh, car cardiovascular community. Uh, but, uh, uh, sorry, and I also uh, clearly, there is a clear link between uh, all of these uh, factors and the genetics analysis and the possibility of evaluating the interaction between the environment, the genetics, and, and the, the electrocardiographic uh, properties. So, People like me in particular are interested in arrhythmia detection and uh, with arrhythmia detection we have a problem with a single ECG because we know that mm, a lot of the uh, really clinically relevant uh, arrhythmias uh, and very common arrhythmias such as for instance atrial fibrillation uh, may be episodic or paroxysmal and also be silent. And, uh, but uh, we know that there is a substantial and the detection with a single ECG or even with a 24-hour ECG. And in fact, today, there were two papers published in the New England Journal of Medicine detailing exactly uh, how this is the case and how much this impinge on the diagnosis of stroke uh, or cryptogenic stroke in particular. Um, we also know that uh, uh, common arrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation increase with age, and so this is really a prime time to look at ECG monitoring in the UK uh, biobank uh, participants because they are now 10 years older than recruitment and much more likely to present with atrial fibrillation. There are important considerations 
uh, associated with uh, the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation or any other arrhythmias indeed, uh, because they can indicate a significant underlying cardiac disease and uh, they can directly cause significant morbidity and mortality, um, you know, mostly in, in, in the case of atrial fibrillation related to cardioembolic events. However, it is also true that for the episodes, short episodes of atrial fibrillation that are recorded on uh, long-term monitoring, the actual uh, cause and association relationship with stroke is less clear than for symptomatic clinically assessed atrial fibrillation. In other words, it's sometimes difficult to understand how six minutes of atrial fibrillation recorded a two months ago could be relevant to a stroke today. I mean, is it that atrial fibrillation in that case is just a biomarker of a cardiac condition, or is it really causative in, in a thromboembolic way? That, so these are all uh, questions that are unresolved. And equally, there are really no large-scale population uh, um, based prospective studies with prolonged ECG monitoring that would assess these questions. So the aspirational uh, part of this talk is really what we wish to have. And what we wish to have within uh, UK Biobank and particularly in the cohort that is uh, undergoing imaging, and you can see clearly why, uh, we, what we wish to have is really uh, non-invasive, minimally invasive, uh, uh, continuous ECG recording for at least uh, uh, 12 to 14 days. Uh, it has been already um, derived from uh, patients with pacemakers or long-term recording uh, that uh, about two weeks of ECG recording would detect approximately 85% of uh, patients uh, with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, for instance. And uh, so what we want is something as easy as this rather than a conventional Holter ECG with multiple <laughs> electrodes. And uh, uh, this is a patch that has a microchip inserted, it's quite small. Um, patients can do anything with this, shower, it, it's, uh, it's very easy. And, uh, and, what is, and, and the beauty of this system is that it can uh, record beat by beat ECG at a very high sampling frequencies. So not only atrial fibrillation, but all sorts of other parameters can be evaluated uh, uh, over two weeks. So the, the average, uh, the median wear is about 12 days. And uh, is recyclable, which in uh, UK biobank speak means that it's reusable, right? So you, essentially all you need here to do is to change the patch and uh, uh, reset the microchip. So we are looking at this device and uh, investigating the feasibility and acceptability of wearing uh, such a patch uh, during the imaging pilot. And we are looking also at a system that would be affordable. So this is ideal because it has already been validated in a large number of patients, but, we, but it, we are also aware that there are several such devices that are being developed in the market. So, to summarize, what is it that UK Biobank has now? These four lead ECG uh, in 85,000 uh, participants. Uh, and uh, as I said, these are good for uh, detection of tachyarrhythmias and patterns of heart rate. What will happen soon are digitized high quality 12 lead ECG in 100,000. <laughs> Uh, participants, and what we would wish to have, the ideal scenario, is a long-term ECG monitor in 100,000s in the cohort that is uh, undergoing uh, uh, imaging, and possibly more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert. I'll just ask John to join us as well. We've just got time for a few questions, if there are any, from the floor. It is quite late. There's just one over here. Hi, Jimmy Whitworth from the Wellcome Trust. I'd be interested to know more about how you would record the data and code the data for arrhythmias or ECGs or whatever in a way that would make it useful for large-scale analysis. Yeah, well, this is 
<laughs> premature uh, because, as I said, we haven't got the... But what we are doing in the um, ECGs that we have is, uh, at the moment, we are recording uh, the um, RR interval and coding tachyarrhythmias. Right, in the, which is in the, in the similar way that pacemaker devices are recording. Uh, and, most, and we know that most of these tachyarrhythmias are atrial fibrillation and we, when we are uncertain. Right? And, and then uh, on the basis of uh, that, we will record the duration of these episodes and code them that way for the, for the moment. The Zeopatch own software is much more uh, sophisticated than that. Uh, it does record uh, various, it, it has an algorithm that can diagnose a wide variety of arrhythmia and all of that can get coded. And uh, if we come to an agreement that they analyze the data, it would come uh, already uh, coded that way. And that has already been validated, the accuracy of this coding. Okay, any more questions? Just. Uh... Sorry, there's one at the back, is there? Yep. Um, it's interesting that you have two types of uh, monitoring. One is the physical activity with the actiograph and, and this heart rate monitoring. Have you considered combining the two? <laughs> yes, I mean, um, <laughs> it is, so there are, um, it is a good idea. Uh, to combine the two, but it also has some drawbacks. So that is that uh, the, what we uh, were really interested in is to have a continuous ECG recording, beat by beat, a real time ECG recording. If you then have, there are devices uh, in the market that can record uh, uh, ECGs, activity, and other things. And then you end up compromising on the sampling frequency and the amount of ECGs that you're actually recording. For instance, we look at another device that also recorded the activity at the same time, but then it would only record uh, two seconds of ECG for every minute. So you come to... It's a give and take. At the moment, it doesn't seem like there is out there a system where you can uh, have your cake and eat it. Uh, so at the moment, you have to compromise. I think I'll just add one more thing to that, Barbara. The, the, um, <clears throat> the, the, the wear or acceptability of the wrist-worn device. I mean, studies that, uh, that Nick have done have shown that the wrist-worn devices are the most acceptable um, to the users. Um, and and you know, getting, those, getting that study going was, was quite important. I think there's one question at the front here, so will be the last one. Yeah, the uh, four lead ECG data, is that uh, digitized as well? Because uh, I, I didn't state it on your slide. The four D. The four lead ECG data. Yes, yes. It's digitized yes. as well. Yes. And is the sampling rate similar? Is yes. 500 hertz? Yes, or? yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll break for tea. Uh, could we be back for four o'clock, please? It just reminds me to thank all of our speakers and our, uh, our panel members for this afternoon's session. Thank you.